How do you know when the national security state has gotten completely out of control? Welcome to the Henry A. Wallace National Security Forum. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. The NSA, Pentagon, and other security agencies rely on outside private contractors to do a lot of their work. Those companies have become experts in spying on U.S. citizens. That's scary enough. But what if they now had new clients? What if big corporations could use them to spy on activists opposing their harmful actions? Heidi Bogosian is a lawyer, radio host, and executive director of the A.J. Must Memorial Institute, which has focused on supporting nonviolence and social justice since 1974. She has defended several people against this type of spying, and she now joins us from New York. Welcome to the program, Heidi. Great to be here. Well, can you begin by telling us what the relationship is between the private security sector and the national security state here in the uh, United States? U.S. intelligence agencies and the private sector in this country work so closely together that they're virtually indistinguishable. They share resources, they share personnel in terms of really a revolving door between government uh, leaders of these agencies who then go to work for the private sector, uh, then come back to work for government, and often advise the president and the national security leaders on policy and who to contract with. So uh, it's rife with conflicts of interest and really blurred lines between the two sectors. Now, do the same regulations that apply to national security agencies of the government also apply to private contractors? Private corporations aren't bound by the U.S. Constitution. So the kind of spying, uh, the in-depth monitoring that they can and do conduct on activists and ordinary Americans uh, is really uh, without oversight and without the kind of rules that government intelligence agencies are supposed to follow. And how do private companies influence our laws and our policies? Uh, one of the institutions that uh, we now know today is quite active and has been active over the years is, is ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is an organization that influences legislation at the state level by being able to meet directly with state representatives. And some of the policies that they recommend that are then implemented, passed and implemented, involve national security. So how much influence do they have in crafting our policies and our laws? ALEC has an enormous amount of influence. They actually draft model legislation. So they will put their full force behind uh, getting legislators to uh, approve uh, laws that they draft. We've seen uh, state laws, anti-terrorism laws, that have also passed on a federal level, such as the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And I think the danger is that when you have corporations uh, writing our laws and doing so because they have a vested interest in protecting their bottom line, for example, it's very easy for them to target lawful activities of Americans, but to craft it in a way that makes ordinary activities such as leafleting or boycotting uh, an industry that, say, treats animals inhumanely, they call that terrorism. And I think that's an enormous danger when it's motivated by a for-profit company who's not accountable to the general public. Now, uh, we know today that the national security framework is used at all levels to justify all sorts of infringements of our rights. Local police departments, for example, are spending a lot of money on national security uh, related enhancements to their police uh, equipment and how they go about gathering intelligence. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, this sort of in mini industry that is built up in local police departments. How lucrative is it? How much funding do they get? And does that funding in the end go back to the very same private companies that write the laws requiring these sorts of things? After the events of 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security uh, created many incentives for local police departments across the country to apply for grants to really bolster uh, their police departments, whether it be by adding equipment, in some cases military tanks, um, as well as uh, other funds that they could then keep 
uh, and sort of make permanent in their, in their departments if they identified local terrorism threat assessments. And what we saw across the country uh, were departments really rushing to come up with threat assessments. In, in many cases, there were websites by law enforcement that encourage people to identify local activists and any kind of event that might attract a diverse group of people to call that the potential for terrorism. And we saw over $34 billion being poured into police departments for that kind of thing. Tell us a little bit about so-called fusion centers. A lot of Americans don't even know what these are, but they exist around the country post 9-11. What are fusion centers and how did they fit within this network we've been talking about? Well, between the years 2003 and 2007, the government realized it really had to step up its efforts to coordinate and streamline intelligence gathering. It was criticized uh, for how it handled the events of 9-11. Uh, there was a lot of waste in government and no transparency. So they created fusion centers, and there are about 73 across the country. But what they do is they, again, streamline the sharing of information between law enforcement, intelligence agencies, and again, the private sector, big business. On the issue of how activism can be targeted, um, let's uh, look at the example of the Occupy Wall Street protest. That was uh, a very uh, large mobilization of activists around the country. And in that case, how did uh, private security companies cooperate with local police departments and the national security state to spy on these activists, to undermine their work? A month or so actually before the first Occupy encampment in New York, the Department of Homeland Security actually knew about it and started reaching out aggressively to uh, financial institutions and banks in New York City and also across the nation. Uh, word quickly spread and the, the Department of Homeland Security started monitoring activists who had been active before and who I believe they suspected would be active in Occupy. And it's worth noting that there was a concerted effort really to keep the media out of the several times when police went in and shot encampments down in New York in the middle of the night and elsewhere uh, around the nation. I think it was because they shared intelligence so effectively, even those just camping out on the streets in front of their banks, but also to share that database with others across the country in a well-coordinated effort. What is the danger to a democratic society when you have a national security state that punishes dissent, that undermines free speech, and that works in such close concert with private companies? The danger is that anyone who acts differently, who challenges the status quo, who may engage in a creative form of protest to get a message out, is labeled and stigmatized as a would-be terrorist. Often, ordinary activists going to what we call national special security events, such as the Republican National Convention, uh, the Democratic Convention, are targeted months before they go to such event because law enforcement has records on them. Uh, their homes may be visited by the FBI asking questions of friends and family. Their offices may be vi visited. And what happens is, it has what we call a chilling effect on the exercise of free speech. People become afraid when they know the FBI has visited their home of what might happen, or if a friend is arrested without probable cause, as we see happen all the time, uh, merely because they are exercising their right to engage in free speech protected activities. Uh, so I think the danger is that we veer much uh, more toward a police state than many may recognize is actually happening, and that we're encouraged never to challenge mainstream thought or to have an original idea of our own, because to do so may label us as an outsider or a different person who becomes suspect. Heidi Bogosian, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, thank you. We know the NSA has listened to our phone calls and spied on foreign leaders. 
But how did the NSA get so powerful in the first place? Find out in our next episode. NSA is created in absolute secrecy. Even its name was top secret, and there were only a couple people, I think no more than two people in Congress, that were even allowed to know it existed. So it was born in absolute secrecy and has remained that way uh, most of its life.